So, hello from Baltimore. This is Thomas Hartung speaking. I hope you can hear me well. Um, I'm not sure whether any formal introduction is planned, but if nobody is jumping in and uh, welcoming you all, I have to, I will do it myself. It's a bit uh, a do it yourself uh, type of uh, presentation as we all do at the moment. Um, yeah, I'm I was invited to give this talk to expand on some things which I have been presenting at the European Parliament lately um, on the same topic to give a little bit more of, of background. And uh, I think it is a very impressive opportunity at the moment to see how the type of systems we have been working on, the alternative methods, non-animal approaches, um, are lending themselves now to help us in a situation where we desperately need fast track type of tools which are delivering relevant uh, information. So let me see quickly. Um, the Okay, so uh, I don't know whether you can see me uh, talking. Um, if not, that's me and uh, a very important message our Center for Alternatives to Animal Testing uh, has always been um, living with the motivation to save more than animals. Uh, I'm a physician in the leading school of public health and it's important to me that we are doing this not just for animal welfare reasons. Uh, my team, um, which I show from our last Christmas party, which was still in person and where we demonstrate that we normally do not socialize very well, um, is working at the moment as everybody is uh, online. Um, but it's not less dedicated and I'm putting them up first because uh, whatever I'm presenting uh, would not have been possible without the team. I think it's also important for you to realize that uh, we are a transatlantic organization. Johns Hopkins CAT is uh, 39 years almost old. Um, and 10 years ago, exactly, we created CAT Europe as a joint venture with the European um, University in, uh, in Constance, it's a German university. Um, and since then with Marcel Leist and some others in partners in crime, uh, we have been promoting the same ideas on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, that's the School of Public Health where I would normally sit uh, at this moment. Um, I took personal time off from working for the European Commission where I was heading the European Center for Validation of Alternative Methods some 11 years ago. And um, I have two appointments here in environmental health and uh, one in microbiology and immunology, which comes in handy now when talking about um, the coronavirus and these type of things. And uh, I think there's no institution like this on the European side. Um, just to give you a bit of feel, in the 104 years of existence um, was the first school of public health. Uh, this has become really a leading institution. There's good reason why you hear the Johns Hopkins School uh, for Public Health um, in the news at the moment very often around Corona because it was meant for this. Um, we have about 2,000 students and uh, it's more than 700 faculty. Um, a $500 million budget. Um, so this is second to none um, worldwide. Uh, but you also need the right government to take advantage of this. And um, you cannot say that um, the coronavirus was, uh, crisis was um, handled especially successfully here. Um, so it's not only about having the know-how, but it's always important about getting this done. Okay, before starting, I would like to acknowledge that um, our work at CUT is supported by industry. Um, you might take this as a conflict of interest. I think it more as a praise for those who are helping us. Um, but it's also supported much more extensively actually by philanthropy. Uh, about three times more money comes in from these sources. And a lot of our work is from, uh, sponsored by the normal competitive resources. So we are trying to be yeah, competitive uh, with others and show that we are doing research which is not just fundable because it's ethically appealing. And if there's anybody on, on the call, on the webinar, who would be interested to join us is missing their logo here. I always find space on my slide. Uh, to be more precise with my conflicts of interest so that you can understand here, um, I'm a consultant and shareholder to Axism who are, um, are commercializing the Johns Hopkins mini brain model. Um, I'm also consulting AstraZeneca in this topic. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about um, artificial intelligence type of work where I'm working with uh, both Underwriters Laboratories UL and Toxtrack, our spin-off company led by Tom Lichtefeld. 
um, I'm consulting the American tissue um, cell type collection. Um, I am uh, have a pyrogen test, which is almost out of all patents, uh, which is uh, distributed by Mac Millipore, which I will talk about a bit. And the, yeah, the Apple appointment does not matter here. Okay, um, yeah, we all live under very special circumstances. This hope, uh, dear God, can you please reboot 2020? It has a virus, was unfortunately not granted, and we have to adapt to this new world, um, which means we are working from home in online meetings, conferences, online teaching, uh, as we do right now. Uh, but it's also quite interesting that this has led to an um, enormous uptake in online teaching, for example. Um, some of you might be aware of um, the courses we are offering in Coursera for free. Um, we have at the moment about 100 people adding uh, to these courses per week, um, which is three times more than we had before the, uh, the corona crisis. So it's a very interesting uh, development that we have more outreach uh, doing this. And these courses are uh, quite well appreciated by the people who are doing them. Okay, this um, corona world um, is different. Um, I had the opportunity quite often now to talk about this, about the use of animals for them, about the, um, the fast track type of research, um, and also about something I will touch on later, uh, whether the brain can actually be infected. And today's um, webinar is in this series of events. Um, the first thing I think we should realize is that the entire story around Corona is a medical success story. Um, this might sound odd to you, but just think about it. Um, the first cases were recognized in December of 2019. Um, on the 31st of December, China officially informed the WHO. Already on the 10th of January, we had a PCR established in the UK outside of China. And uh, China revealed the genome of the virus on the 11th of January. There's even discussion that they had it already a week earlier. And um, the first diagnostics, the one which is now um, recommended and primarily used by the WHO, came out of Germany on the 17th of January. And since March, we have a number of antibody tests available, which are increasingly being employed. And Already on the 1st of May this year, the FDA approved the first drug for which it was shown that it is shortening um, the disease time um, in the clinic. Um, you might recall remdesivir, which came out of Ebola research originally and was repurposed here. Uh, if you compare this just for fun uh, with the HIV crisis, yeah, uh, we had the first cases in 81. Um, the virus was identified in two years later. Um, with the first WHO meetings, uh, tests in 85, um, the first treatment uh, in, in 87, uh, vaccine trials starting in, in 87, and uh, home kits, like they're already now available, became available in 1996, some 15 years later, and uh, it took them uh, you know, almost 20 years to come to really uh, uh, useful therapies, and the first vaccine is still far away. Uh, so that's really a very different story. Um, the medical challenge is enormous, uh, however, now to move towards drugs and vaccines, and uh, everybody wants them as fast as possible, to an extent that politicians make promises about availability, um, which are interesting, to say the least, yeah, um, as, a, as you see the challenge. Um, we have been interested, as this is our job, um, very much into um, what is the um, uh, what is the possibility now to help this, support this with alternative methods? Um, as you can see, this is an article which is now online available from Archives of Toxicology, where we summarized our thinking. And those of you who don't have the time to listen to the entire talk, I invite you to read this. A lot of this you find in this article. It is making a case that for all these different aspects listed to the right, um, alternative methods have something to offer whether it's for drug repurposing, so the use of a drug which was used for a different type of, um, of, of disease, often now HIV and other virus infections, uh, failed drugs or drugs which are in, in current use. Uh, um, not only uh, the, um, um, the very much toted uh, uh, treatments with uh, anti-malarials, uh, which have not done a proper job as we know, 
but uh, also really uh, very very selective drugs uh, in uh, interfering with with, with drugs uh, with, with virus infections. Uh, but also for drug target discovery, for drug efficacy testing, for the development of vaccines, uh, and then combination therapies, drug safety and quality assurance of uh, the production batches. There's a, something to be said, and I will expand on all of these ideas, or most of them, of them uh, a little bit. Um, from my point of view, it is always important to see uh, this in the context of the economic pressures. Um, this is an article from two years ago where we summarized uh, the most important omics is economics to make understand why we can or cannot use certain alternative approaches. Um, I invite you to read this. Altex um, is an open access journal, so it's all available here. And uh, what you have to see first is that drug development is something which is extremely costly. Um, you see here the costs for preclinical and clinical development increasing uh, here um, over the different decades. Um, today, um, we have to assume that drug development does cost on average 2.9 billion for one drug. And part of these enormous costs is because 95% fail in the clinical phase. Um, at the same time, this has become more and more costly in inflation uh, corrected terms. We have an 80-fold decrease in what you get for a million, for a billion dollar uh, in R&D uh, with respect to drugs. So it's getting more and more costly to find something new. And there's no reason to assume that uh, COVID-19 drugs should be any cheaper. Um, interestingly, at the same time, this industry is moving out of animal testing. Um, the previous statistics of the EU allowed to discern this, and you see here that in six years only. Um, the use of animals for by the pharmaceutical industry between 2005 and 2011, despite increased R&D costs, uh, declined by more than 40%. So this is really um, a trend that this industry, which is very much under pressure, is actually moving away from the animal testing and is obviously making use of others. Um, you see on top this, uh, for me, a very surprising finding, uh, Markets and Markets published this, uh, that um, of the money we spend on toxicology, um, the vast majority is in vitro. It is 4.2 billion in vivo and 14.4 billion in vitro. And this is illustrating how much we are actually moving already to non-animal methods or new approach methods. Um, a very important point to understand in, uh, in now getting towards certain methods being acceptable or not is the critical role the US market has. Um, here in the US, we have 4.25% of the world population, uh, but we are consuming 64% of the drugs under patent and 48% of all drugs in the world. Um, so this market is dominating and every pharmaceutical company is looking what are the rules of the game here. This is why the Food and Drug Administration is more equal than others. Um, so if we are talking about the acceptability of the new tools, uh, it's very important with, whether the FDA approves them or does not approve. And for this reason, um, I've been so excited over the last years to see how the FDA has, for example, been pushing for microphysiological systems, uh, the type of advanced cell culture that we're going to discuss um, in a second. Um, we obviously need now fast preclinical methods to move fast into clinical testing. Um, I was stunned when I looked for the article uh, cited already, um, when I looked into the registers, uh, on the 19th of April, there was already 1,684 clinical studies launched, with 637 of them being interventions, so drug treatments, and uh, 781 um, at management mainly of, uh, of the disease. But, but imagine this, within months, we only on this month only, we moved into so many clinical trials, which means for all of these substances, there needs to be a case for their efficacy, and there needs to be at least minimal safety data, which typically would come out of years of, um, of preclinical research. Um, so it's a lot of repurposing, obviously, of things where we had some of this, but still it requires some work. Um, let's have a look into vaccines, and I come back to the same article here. Um, 
It takes on average eight to 18 years to develop a new vaccine at costs of about 900 million euro, um, which I think is, uh, is, is, should dampen a little bit our expectations, how fast we can expect for a new virus to get, get a vaccine. Um, it is a certain growth market. There's now revised data, which suggests uh, through to uh, COVID-19, we would expect an enormous increase in vaccine in vaccine uh, development. Um, interestingly, again, 45% uh, of revenue is made in the US with vaccines. So again, it is the biggest market and paying the biggest prices. Um, quite contrary to this, uh, the global market for vaccine production is shared by mainly five companies listed here. Um, and these companies are mainly producing out of uh, out of uh, Europe um, about 80 percent of the doses of vaccines produced worldwide are produced in Europe and 80 percent of these are then exported into the rest of the world so it is a, a astonishing uh, distribution um, but this has something to do that vaccines is not the most appealing part of the pharmaceutical industry and I will explain this in a second um, it is fascinating, stunning, that already um, now a publication listed 115 vaccines for COVID-19, which are under development. Again, enormous how fast the scientific community has taken up this challenge. Uh, the citation is found in our article. Um, this is very much contrary to the overall development um, that the pharmaceutical companies actually went out of the development. Of, of, of vaccines. Um, this article here uh, states, states very clearly the development timelines of on average uh, 12 uh, years um, and the market acceptance probability of 6% uh, does not really make this a, a big deal. Uh, and you see here how long it took years to approval for a variety of, of vaccines which came to the market. Uh, this is not giving you a lot of hope. And the big problem is that um, once you have produced this, um, the profit margins are typically for a vaccine much lower than for, for other drugs as they are used as uh, a public health measure, um, vaccinate, mass vaccinating people. Um, this, is not, this is something which is under tremendous cost uh, expectations. And um, developing a vaccine is no different to developing a drug. Um, we have the same phases of clinical development, um, safety, immunogenicity uh, data, uh, then starting to look into um, dose ranges and uh, some uh, more safety issues, and then a large scale trial, typically much larger than uh, a, a drug trial, because you have to vaccinate people who are at risk of infection, but are not necessarily having the disease or getting the disease. And for the more rare stuff, um, you really have to vaccinate uh, thousands of people in order to have a sufficient probability uh, of getting enough people infected to see whether they, um, that they uh, ha have a better outcome than those which were not uh, immunized. And that's very problematic uh, and it's unethical to vaccinate, uh, to infect people uh, even after a vaccination um, with a virus. So it is really highly problematic. Um, how how these large trials can be set up in short period of time and who's going to pay for them. And then you have the typical phases of acceptance and um, further controls which are not interest at the, uh, of interest at the moment. Um, at the same time, we have a lot of expectations for what a vaccine should do. Um, it should not produce only a good immune response. Uh, we typically want not only an antibody response, so everybody's only measuring antibodies and talking about antibodies, but in many cases, this is actually natural killer cells which have to kill the virus-infected cell in order to get um, uh, to get the virus out of the body. We want long-lived immunity. Um, ideally, if, especially for the developing countries, you want a single dose. Uh, you have safety concerns. Um, you want um, that there is no reversion to virulence. So if you use attenuated viruses, that they don't suddenly become bad guys again. Uh, especially when they're used in immunocompromised people. 
Um, you want stability. Um, the vaccine needs to be stable on the shelf in the pharmacy, uh, when transported, whatever. Um, for the life, uh, for the life vaccinations, you have to uh, to keep them viable, which often requires cool chains. Um, the vaccine preparations are often very adverse to storage conditions, if there's, especially if they are live. Um, you want to lower the expenses. Um, typically, um, vaccine production is only at one to two dollar per dose, um, and then it is mass uh, released. But if you have costs of more than a billion in producing one, um, it will not be easy to, um, to work uh, without uh, substantial profit margins. And they should be cheap in preparation for the future. Um, we've published earlier this year um, this article about the European use statistics on, on animals. Um, you see it here again, it's open access. Um, what was really fascinating for us was to see that the biggest advances we have seen was actually in the vaccine area, um, where animal use has declined uh, very substantially. Um, and this includes also the quality control. Um, a lot of this uh, of this post or uh, this uh, of this number is driven by vaccine testing and uh, and and, and pyrogenicity testing of vaccines. Um, this, so this is really um, um, a very interesting area, and this is even more important as these are often very severe um, experiments. Um, they are representing more than 25% of all severe uses in the EU because these animals are being vaccinated and then often infected. And there's a control group which has the full infection, and there's the treatment group which has a lesser infection, but it's a, um, it is very demanding severe animal experimentation. But it is an area of enormous progress, um, and um, please read the article if you're interested in more details. Um, just to show you here uh, the extent, um, I'm typically working in toxicology. Open Tox is devoted to this. You can see here the number of animals in toxicology, which have dropped over time, a bit at least, um, though there's a, a bit of a little trick behind this, which I'm not going to discuss at the moment, to keep them low. Um, but uh, what you can see here, uh, a very substantial decrease at the same time in the quality control, batch safety and potency testing uh, from 1.8 million to 1.1. Um, so this is really the area which was successfully abandoning some animal testing. Um, so this is really uh, contributing um, to the overall uh, decrease in regulatory testing, which, is, which we observed. So what we now need is models for disease, uh, for target evaluation, for drug treatment, for the kinetics, the adsorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion of the drugs we want to use, for toxicity, for immunization responses, and for batch quality assurance. So there's a, a lot asked for, and um, alternative approaches have something to offer. Uh, I think the most exciting development over the last decade or so was that we are really moving away from this classical idea of cell culture with a petri dish with some cells, typically a tumor cell line, uh, which is looking like pen fried eggs in a pen, sunny side up. Um, we were moving to scaffolds, to 3D tissues, to tissues on chip, and this is continuing now even to multi-organ and uh, human on chip type of approaches. Um, this development um, is really making our systems more relevant. That's my strong belief. In some cases, it's making our life also very complicated and costly, but it is offering something. And we have held two workshops um, on the topic. The last one um, in 2019, in June, in Berlin. Um, they are both electronically available. They have been published. There will be the, the second one that will be the next issue of Altex, uh, which gives you stakeholder view on these developments. Um, they're cited here to the right. And um, these type of models are being used. Um, obviously, um, I'm taking here the example of two commercial models um, from Epitelix and from Matek. Um, we already have the first publications which are using them for SARS and corona infection. You can see this very nice organotypic cultures um, in air liquid interface culture. And we have to assume that these type of systems are for the primary infection being used um, uh, much more broadly. Um, this is the lung on chip model. 
uh, which was very much in the beginning of um, the strong investment of FDA in this area because it was developed with some FDA funding by the Harvard Wyss Institute and led to um, a science paper in 2012. You see this beautiful model where there's stretch from breathing to the cells, which strongly improves their um, improves their um, differentiation. Um, so this is a very promising model. And actually, there's already again um, the um, the first publications coming out. Um, two of these very advanced uh, models are at the moment being employed for um, uh, risk funding from the defense uh, agencies here in India are going to go into. BSL-3, so safety laboratories of level three, uh, to allow corona research on these type of models. And um, organoids are mushrooming. Um, we find essentially each and every organ now being reconstructed, often from stem cell technologies, uh, creating organ functionalities and organ uh, architectures in vitro. You can find them all. Um, Francis Collins, the <clears throat> head of NIH, um, made this statement in 2011 already. Um, it may be justified to skip any model assessments of efficacy altogether. And more importantly, in 2016, um, he showed one of these chips and said, I predict that 10 years from now, safety testing for newly developed drugs, as well as assessment of the potential of toxicity of numerous environmental exposures, may be largely carried out using biochips and will mostly replace animal testing for drug toxicity and environmental sensing, giving results that are more accurate at lower cost and with higher throughput. So this was testimony here uh, to Congress. So it was about funding and you saw see the enormous emphasis put here behind this. Um, so for those of you, uh, especially on the European side, who always have the feeling that the US is lagging behind, uh, this is absolutely not the case. The technological developments are here on par, if not even more advanced, and the political support has also changed dramatically from what we what was here some 10 years ago. Okay, so here again, um, the slide with the uh, with the workshop reports. I think these are some of the most comprehensive state-of-the-art uh, descriptions of these technologies you can possibly get. Okay, um, interestingly, um, we were invited and have submitted a science perspective. Um, we hope that this will get some more visibility to this, so stay tuned for uh, for this. Okay, I will talk now a little bit about <clears throat> our own project, um, which is a mini brain project, um, which we have been uh, working on for almost a decade. Um, we published this um, in 2016, not as the first group to have a mini brain, I think we were the third, uh, actually, but we were the first one to mass produce these cell balls, completely identical, uh, produce thousands of them per batch, so that they are actually uh, lending themselves to testing, uh, both for drugs and for um, and, and for toxicity testing. Uh, our motivation was autism. <clears throat> um, you see the explosion of autism cases. Um, so this is really an important emerging disease. The last data suggests that in the US, one in 59 children is born with autism, which was a rare commodity in the 70s. Um, I think this will be the en endocrine disruptor testing program of the next decade, because at some point society will want to know whether what contributes. But we also should be, keep aware, be aware that infection inflammation is the key risk factor for autism. And um, the cytokine storm induced by virus infections like um, like COVID-19 um, is possibly contributing to these type of, um, of, of neurodevelopmental disorders, as many virus infections have been already discussed as possible risk factors. Um, we are very much interested in DNT. Um, we teamed up in 2005 already uh, with my previous team in ECVAM and uh, CAT, at the time Alan Goldberg, and uh, we went through all of this. I, just wanted to tell you the fifth international conference was unfortunately not taking place on 4th to 6th of April this year because of the known circumstances. But we are at the moment considering a, um, another postponement from November, where we originally postponed to 2021. So those of you interested, please stay tuned for this. Um, the model is <clears throat> lends itself to developmental pro processes because it is reflecting 
I would say something like events in the first five months of, of, of embryo development, uh, because we have an accelerated maturation of this of this brain uh, in eight weeks. And it has been used um, first with rotenone uh, to show that we can demonstrate the developmental neurotoxicity of rotenone, uh, coming to the conclusion that this is possible. Oh, by the way, yeah, the model is available through Axism, as I said, my conflict of interest. Um, the EPA last September, when announcing uh, that they want to move out of animal testing by 2035, did choose our model um, as a grant to Lena Smanova um, to develop this essay to a feasible essay, and uh, they announced it the same day that they are receiving funding for uh, for developing this. So it's a it's a DNT essay in its making. Uh, we just published um, a case study then on paroxetine, which is a an inhibitor of um, of, uh, new, uh, of serotonin reuptake, so it's an antidepressant, uh, quite commonly used, which had been under discussions uh, to produce birth defects, um, among them also uh, alleg allegations of antidepressants uh, causing autism, which has never been completely confirmed. Um, but we were able in this model to show that clinically relevant concentration of paroxetine do have new developmental impacts. Um, this was another press release earlier this year. Uh, I'm saying this because um, when now looking into virus infection and corona, uh, this model is obviously also one which would be very interesting to see whether there's neurodevelopmental derailment uh, taking place due to virus infections. Um, because in fact, um, we have been using the mini brain model for virus infections in the past. This is a publication uh, from 2018 which added not only the immune cells of the of the brain, the microglia, but um, we showed dengue and Zika virus infectability. Um, we have data on HIV and uh, JC virus, um, which are under publication or preparation for publications. And because of this earlier work um, and prompted by the fact that um, for COVID-19, 36% um, of patients in China apparently showed neurological symptoms. And other coronaviruses are known to be neurotropic, which means to infect, able to infect uh, the um, the brain. Um, we were getting interested into this. Uh, so okay, this is a bit. So we teamed up here um, with a team uh, in the School of Medicine, uh, Bill Visai Vis and uh, Corinne Bullen, who are working on uh, COVID-19 at the moment, and uh, we simply tried: can we infect our mini brains? Uh, but first of all, we looked into, is the receptor there? And I already took away <laughs> the suspense by the previous uh, previous slide. Indeed, we do have numbers of this AC2 receptor, um, which are not highly expressed, but we find them already in the neuronal precursor cells. So clearly indicating that also the developing brain is at risk to, to take up um, this. Um, so it's a it's a low expression, but it is clearly uh, 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 positive against uh, other controls. Interestingly, we did not find the uh, TMPRSS2 receptor, which is believed to be part of the entry into lung cells. Um, so could be infectable, could not be infectable. And um, I'm actually sharing with you for the first time publicly um, that we have been able to infect indeed our mini brains. Um, what you can see here is what we consider neuronal cells full of full, fully packed with viruses. Um, so this is establishing that neuron, neurons can be infected uh, with this new virus. Um, it's not many cells, as you can see here within the mini brain. There's a few of these red dots, but these have uh, a lot of these mini brains. Um, we don't know which cells. We don't know. Uh, how extensive the replication is, whether it's leading to progressive infection, uh, whether there's any pathology involved. We don't know whether this is disrupting neurodevelopment is really the last, the first thing. But uh, what we can see is an increase in virus um, in the system, also by PCR. There's at least um, a tenfold increase in total within in the well, but a 37-fold increase in the tissue, um, which is suggesting that there is active replication of the virus. Uh, in these cells. Um, this paper is under review. Uh, you see the team here again. Um, our own um, 
Elena, Fena, Lena and Carolina and our teams and also Andy Pekosch, a specialist for coronavirus who helped getting both uh, our groups started in this, uh, co-authoring this. And I like especially uh, the picture to the left because you see it completely, it shows uh, the babies and that's the reason why this team is very much working on developmental neurotoxicity and developmental immunotoxicity because uh, we have a vested interest. Okay. Um, so, what, you, what I hope to have shown you is that these micropathophysiological systems um, allow to model a variety of diseases. Um, I mentioned some of them, including virus infections. Um, this is only a starting point. What you can see here is the more advanced tissue and chip type of models, which are at the moment being used for this type of research. Uh, this goes even to the VIS body on chip system with 10 organs um, for 28 days combining a variety of ships, um, all of them being at this moment being employed for um, COVID-19 research. Um, we are very much interested in developing, this is the core team uh, of people involved, um, also the quality assurance for these systems. We call it Good Cell Culture Practice uh, 2.0 um, and we are at the moment finalizing the draft uh, guidance and uh, going into stakeholder discussions if you're interested to join discussion about how to quality assure these type of systems, please uh, contact us and watch out for the next Altex issue. Um, this is also linked to activities of ours on uh, in vitro reporting standards, uh, because it's all about not only doing the right work, but also reporting it properly. Um, and this is a publication steered by my partner in crime, Marcel Leist, uh, on how to describe uh, these test systems properly from last December. Um, but we don't not only need the organ models and disease models, uh, vaccine uh, re release often requires batch release testing, and this can include pyrogenicity testing because these are injectables. Uh, just to give you an idea about the dimension of animal use here, in this decade of 2006 to 2016, 6,000 batches of influenza have been released and each and every one tested in animal tests in Europe. Yeah. So that's the reason why we have so many um, have so many animals being used here. And um, this is actually one of my claims to fame in the area. I'm putting up this picture in 1996 when I was awarded the first award for this uh, for for a pyrogen test I had developed. And there's actually Bill Russell to the lower left um, um, sitting in the audience uh, when I was receiving this uh, um, um, uh, this award. I'm putting this up to give this all a historic perspective, 1996, the model was actually described in 1995. Um, five years ago, I could report on the 20 years lessons learned. I could now do a 25 year update on this um, and it is still hardly being used. Um, we have seen that uh, only until most recently, the animal numbers did not really drop despite acceptance uh, in by FDA, European Pharmacopeia, US Pharmacopeia and ISO, but only in more recent years, um, alternative methods need to be reinforced. And they can do a job, uh, in the interest of time, I will skip this a bit, uh, but what is important to me is uh, we need to take advantage of the crisis and this, the current strong impetus to, to use these models for reducing actually animal testing. This is pyrogenicity testing data. And we were excited to see that finally um, the numbers go down from some 160, 170,000 um, 15 years ago. We are now down um, in uh, to some 35,000. So this is really an, a success story uh, in the alternative field. Um, toxicology is uh, challenged as well by the models. Um, I think that the, beside the uh, new cell culture type of models, we have to think about the um, big data type of approaches um, from high throughput screening, high content imaging, multi-omics technologies, also to read across of created legacy data and other type of QCR and things, because these are disruptive technologies. They're all faster than an animal test. And uh, from my point of view, often they promise to be more human relevant. Again, um, if you want to get an update about what happened over the last decade, this is an article online available since December, um, spearheaded by Dan Kruski in Archives of Toxicology, um, which is summarizing what has happened over this, this decade. And um, toxicology 
is is really changing also in the pharma setting and this could be very important now for um helping that less substances fail in clinical trials because of toxicological side effects because 20 to 40 percent of drugs do not make it in the end to the to, to marketing uh, because uh, they show some side type of side effects or toxicology in the parallel uh, animal studies uh, we have published on the topic how toxicology can be more than regulatory testing um, what we call investigative toxicology um, a consortium of investigative uh, toxicologists in Europe has uh, was part of this uh, of, of this workshop, and um, it is really about anticipating risk or also de-risking. If something is seen in the animals, what can we do to show that this is not human relevant and others? Uh, again, read into it. I think this is a very important innovation which is very much driven by uh, the new approach methods. So big data is one of the um, is one of the basis for all of this and i would for a few slides at least uh, mention our own work in this area which is on automated read across um, and this is in the end about bringing artificial intelligence into the game um, th there's now several publications which are gearing into this direction of a generalized read across something which is doing taking advantage of information we have from similar substances with computational means um, it is a marriage of two technologies, um, manual read across and QSAR, and uh, we termed it RASAR, a read across based structure activity relationship, uh, which we developed with underwriters laboratories. So, in essence, what we did is um, we created a similarity map of the chemical universe where chemicals are placed sim uh, close to each other, which are chemically similar. This took an Amazon cloud server. Um, two days with 180 cores and $5,000 of costs to calculate the first map. In the meantime, fortunately, we can do better. And I will not uh, bore you with details as this has been published all, some, almost two years ago now. Uh, but the important message is quite a few health effects can be addressed with very impressive sensitivities and specificities altogether in our cross-validation of 190,000 chemicals with known properties, 87% were correct. Um, this led to a lot of interest, uh, nature and science and others, um, and also some uh, interest from the pharmaceutical industry. This is Stefan Platz from AstraZeneca, um, and he very pointedly remarked, uh, uh, commenting on this work, AI will not replace toxicologists, uh, but those who don't use AI will replace by those who do. Um, I think this was a very nice uh, way of expressing it. I believe these are the tools of the future. And there's a version 2.0 released on the 15th of January uh, using deep learning, applicability domains, expressing certainty, and uh, also addressing potency issues. So uh, I invite you to uh, check this out if you're interested. Uh, notably, the Australian chemical safety legislation already has um, accepted this uh, for five health hazards um, in um, starting from 1st of July. Um, so it is starting to get some recognition. Uh, the FDA uh, has announced last year already at the SOT that they're exploring this for um, um, for uh, food additives and cosmetics, and I hope that it's also soon being used for other things. So as a kind of summary of this uh, few slides, um, I think that um, this is not just the next hype. It's really a game changer because it uses local validity, not um, Chem predictions uh, across the chemical universe on a mathematical base. The power of big data is coming in and uh, with biological support data, this is getting even better. Um, so a lot of this is already implemented in the new version and stay tuned for the publications to follow. For example, uh, this is a publication already online available where we use this uh, to predict human uh, data uh, on skin sensitization um, and there's more to follow uh, of this kind. Um, we also make use of uh, similar machine learning tools to uh, understand molecular mechanism of toxicity. Um, Alex Mertens and my team is leading these. Uh, she had a nice paper in Nature's online journal, uh, Scientific Reports in February, looking into cancer mechanisms. And she's on at the moment working on COVID-19 using similar types of tools. Uh, so it's really about mining data uh, with these advanced technologies for mechanistic work. Um, bit of a uh, shameless um, plug for uh, for a journal I helped launch uh, two years ago. 
Frontiers in Artificial Intelligence and Frontiers in Big Data. I'm Chief Editor for the Artificial Intelligence Journal and, and for both journals doing the cross-listed section on public health and medicine. Um, they're really starting nicely. This is my editorial board, a um, lot of uh, top people. Um, we have published almost 100 articles now um, in, in these two years. It's uh, just the last 12 years, so 79 published articles and so on. Um, and we have research topics. Um, what you can imagine, but we have, for example, the most successful research topic ever started uh, is involving here uh, coronavirus uh, with a lot of um, submissions already. And uh, emerging medicine, um, toxicology, uh, with some of our associate editors, editors leading this, Yvonne Wilf from Janssen and Walter Tong from FDA, is also um, uh, very nicely progressing. <laughs> Uh, the last aspect, um, which I would like to stress very quickly, because we are running out of time, um, we also have to see that we have to handle an enormous number of publications. Um, today, I checked 21,000 articles already in PubMed, uh, so peer-reviewed published articles, and someone, some people have to read them and condense them for us. And this is the goal for um, what we um, do within the evidence-based toxicology collaboration, um, where we are trying to bring systematic reviews, where we're trying to bring these tools from evidence-based medicine to, um, uh, to the field. Um, it is an area, um, I have a chair for evidence-based toxicology and we created in 2011 the evidence-based toxicology collaboration to do this systematically. What you can see here, the director is Katja Tsayun. Tsayun. Um, you see here EPA, FDA, and others uh, on the board of this of trustees. So this is trying to help this and other areas, and it's being applied increasingly by EPA, NIH, FDA, uh, OECD, EFSA, the Food Safety Authority, and others. And I think again, it will help us to get hand on control on on what we are doing. And this requires consensus. This requires quality scoring of the papers and. Uh, uh, a primer on systematic reviews in toxicology was one of the contributions we did somewhat earlier. So it's really about um, helping to read um, the, the literature to get something important. Uh, we had a number of workshops most recently on how to develop these concepts further. So let me come to conclusion. Um, I think important to say once again, the medical challenge of the, uh, of the epidemic uh, illustrates some of the shortcomings of the animal-based development and the opportunities of these new technologies, these are really uh, getting us uh, faster and hopefully more relevant forward. Um, Europe leads in many aspects of regulation, but the US leads in regulatory sciences, um, but the solutions are global. And it's not important what comes from Europe, what comes from the US, it's only important whether the international community has it available. Um, and whatever it's driving us to get to these new approach methods, uh, they are a key opportunity for drugs and vaccines and in, in, in COVID and beyond. So alternative methods are enabling technologies. This is my take home message for you. Thank you very much.